Hello, everyone, and welcome to Central Library for another of the 21 LA Made programs we have scheduled this season here in the lovely Tabor Auditorium. My name is Wendy Westgate, and I'm part of the Los Angeles Public Library's LA Made team. LA Made is a series of cultural programs funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And in our fourth season, we have 165 educational and entertaining programs to choose from. And now I'd like to introduce today's program, Black Angelino Trailblazer Families. We'll start this afternoon with an excerpt from the documentary Los Angeles, Displacement in Utopia, produced by the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center at CSUN. We will then transition into a historical overview of pivotal moments in Black LA history that helped shape the legacies represented on the panel today. We will end our program with an interesting discussion about legacy building and civil service led by Tyree Boyd Pates, history curator at the California African American Museum. And the impetus for this program is Los Angeles Public Library's relationship with the Edmonds family and the recent digitization of their family newspaper, The Liberator. The Liberator was one of LA's turn of the century African American newspapers owned and operated by Jefferson Lewis Edmonds. And you will hear more about him later in the program. The multimedia panel discussion was designed and co-produced by Ariane Edmonds and Amanda Charles, Librarian 3 at Central Library. To start things out, we will hear from Keith Rice, historian archivist at the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center, Cal State University, Northridge. Mr. Rice is currently completing his PhD in history at Claremont Graduate University while managing the Tom and Ethel Bradley Archive of Photographic and Oral Histories, helping to document underrepresented communities in Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Mr. Keith Rice. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So what I'm going to do today is go through a little historical overbrief of early um, African American history in Los Angeles. But first, I'm going to do that by showing a, a small portion of a documentary we produced for an NEH grant that we received in 2013. The, the reason for producing this grant is because, of, I mean, a documentary is because a lot of young people like visual and audio aids to learn. So we created this for 11th graders and above to learn a little history about African-American um, restrictive covenants, gentrifications, and places where black people couldn't live in the 20th century and even earlier than that. Um, yeah, and after that, I will show some clips and discuss early African-American history in Los Angeles, specifically the three time periods that will be represented in the panel to follow me. So after, um, so to go on, let's go with the video, Displacement in Utopia. Los Angeles is one of the most well-known cities in the world. As a cultural, financial, and commercial center of Southern California, Los Angeles is the second largest city in the United States with a population of four million. With its beautiful beaches, almost perfect weather, and unsurpassed entertainment industry, the city has long been considered the quintessential land of opportunity for those seeking fame, fortune, and even fresh starts. A hallmark of Los Angeles is its racial and ethnic diversity. The international diversity of the city is showcased in its neighborhoods. Little Tokyo and Chinatown near the city center, Little Ethiopia in the Mid Wilshire District, Little Armenia in East Hollywood, and large Latin American communities in East LA, Southgate, and MacArthur Park. The historic area of Lamert Park near Crenshaw Boulevard reflects the richness of African American culture. This diversity is not surprising, considering that the founding settlers were of mixed-race people, originating from the Mexican provinces of Sinaloa and Sonora. 
Felipe de Neve, the first Spanish governor of California, recruited 11 families from these Mexican provinces. Of the 44 pobladores, 26 were of African descent, 16 were Indian, and two were European. One of the reasons why you have a high number of Afro-Hispanics in that group is because Spain also had what they called the caste system. And that system, really based on uh, your status, told you everything from what jobs you could have, uh, what clothes you could wear, right down to the jewelry that you could wear. So these people looking for new opportunity were the most, how would you say, most likely to sign on to the expedition. Imagine that you've been the landed gentry, you're, you're the, at the tip of the spear in your, in your community. You know, your relatives have been the mayor, governor, things like that, and then overnight everything changes. The language changes, the laws change. You have an influx of people who, who despise you. Now instead of, you know, keep in mind there was no black consciousness movement for these people, so most of the landed gentry, the Californios, they, they leaned towards uh, and, and they modeled themselves after European nobility. The whole idea between 1850 and 1880 was to take the land away. I mean, look, look today. Very few of the original grantees of, of these huge land grants actually own their land today. One of the few exceptions is the Dominguez family, which Manuel Dominguez insisted that his daughter marry white men in order to keep the land intact. And it, for the most part, it worked. It gets under my skin when I hear people say, well, Pio Pico just mismanaged his money and gambled his fortune away. He was a millionaire by anybody's standard for the, that time, so he did live well. But he did not gamble all of his money away, you know, or did he mismanage it to that degree. He was swindled. He was taken advantage of by a racially biased court system. During Spanish and Mexican rule, individuals of African and mulatto heritage held prominent government positions. Pio Pico, the last governor of California under Mexican rule, was a large landowner and businessman who achieved great success in real estate and opened a lavish hotel near the plaza. The Pico House still stands at the plaza today. After California was admitted to the Union as a free state in 1850, some of the most influential black pioneers emerged. Former slave by the name of John Ballard moved to California from Kentucky in 1859 and settled in Agora Hills near the Santa Monica Mountains. This area was commonly referred to as Niggerhead Mountain and later Negrohead Mountain. Bridget Mason was born a slave in Mississippi in 1818. Mason and her daughters eventually traveled to San Bernardino, California with their master in 1851 as he sought to join a Mormon outpost. But when Mason's master was preparing to sell them in Texas, a slave state, she petitioned for her freedom in the California courts and won. Mason and her daughters settled in Los Angeles. She worked as a nurse, midwife, and herbalist. Saving her money, Mason became one of the first African Americans to purchase land. Through her real estate investments, Bridget Mason had a massive fortune worth $300,000 at the time of her death in 1891. Mason taught her children and grandchildren the value of owning property. Eventually, when the railroad comes in, that's when you start really seeing black communities. The expansion of the Santa Fe Railroad dropped the rates and made it cheaper for people to migrate to Los Angeles. Because of this and the widespread promotion of a beautiful, attainable life that included owning land, the city was booming with people. As a matter of fact, John J. Nemore, owner of the California Owl newspaper, stated around the turn of the century, This new country not only attracted Negroes, but also people from all parts of the globe, seeking a new life of freedom and dignity, who poured into California. It was this intermingling of cultures that was to give color and glamour to the future land of the California West.
Thank you. Looking at that, has anyone ever produced a documentary in here? It is so much work. It is unbelievable how much work that is. That's six, six minutes of a 20-minute mini documentary. So we kind of cut it down for this presentation, but that 20 minutes killed us. It took us a year and a half, part-time, me, myself, me, um, Dr. Karen Stanford, my colleague, and the student worker, Pilar De Haro. I have to mention them every time because, and thank you, Robert, for participating. It was so much work, but I think it was worth it. Um, you can go to the Tom Nelson Bradley website and you can see the 20 minute version. We're also adding some more clips to extend it even a little bit longer. So as it, you know, I want to mention, as you noticed, I don't know how many people are aware that over half of the first settlers in Los Angeles was of African descent. I think it was like two Europeans, but the rest were African descent. Recent, recently, you know, I found out that New York, its first settler in Manhattan um, I have his name somewhere. He was also of African descent in 1613, and they just renamed part of Broadway under his name. And also, some of you may know that also Chicago was found first settled by Jean-Baptiste Dusable, another African. So Los Angeles, I mean, America's three biggest cities have a direct connection to African Americans or Africans, you know, enslaved. So after, oh, let me click. So in the, as it ended, it was 1880s or so when the trains came. So African-Americans started moving to Los Angeles in greater numbers. So by the 1900s, there was like 2,000 African-Americans in Los Angeles, greater number than San Francisco. And what develops is it's OK as long as there are a few African-Americans here or there or in different locations. But when the numbers started getting too big, they wanted to confine them, and they use this um, racial restrictive covenants as a way to do that. And if you don't know what that is, they write into the deeds and the titles of property that they can only be occupied or owned by Caucasians and not by other minorities. And this is around 1915, around World War I. Um, even though the mass migration didn't occur in LA to the de degree that it did in, say, Detroit, New York, Chicago, the racial restrictive covenants were instituted all, along, all around the country. So race was another way of kind of um, not only keeping African Americans geographically located, but it also affected your finances. Because if they put you, uh, African Americans, in one area and say that area is not, the value is less, and put Caucasians in another area, then automatically you have more income, you have more money when you sell your property, and it's just the same um, reason that race was created originally to help one group of people have more than another group. So um, as you can see, Lamar Lamar Park was one of those areas that had racial restricted covenants, and I should mention African Americans mostly occupy the corridor along Central Avenue from downtown to, I think, Slauson. Then it jumped over where they could occupy territory in Watts. And they couldn't go east of Alameda. And I'm not sure if it was like maybe west of Maine or Broadway. But it was concentrated for those first few years. And, and the racial restrictive covenants didn't end until 19, I think, 1948 with the work of Lauren Miller, local um, lawyer and political activist who helped Thurgood Marshall break down those restrictive covenants. Actually, what they did in 1948 was stop allowing the government to be able to enforce those restrictions. It was not until like 1953 that they actually struck them down. So when the Great Migration does occur in Los Angeles, you have a lot of African Americans leaving the South because of um, racism, discrimination, actual physical violence, but they also is due to World War II because the defense industry develops in California and it's good jobs for African Americans and a good reason to come here. So what happens during that time is um, I've, done, I've collected, conducted oral history interviews with members of the Black Panthers, members of US organization, other black power um, organizations in LA, and these migrants, when they moved here in the 1940s, they brought young children, or they had young children once they got here. So these kids um, kind of grew of age in the 1950s, 
1960s. So what happened, they see what's going on in the South. They see, for instance, um, Emmett Till in the Jet magazine. And this is a reason that, that kind of drives them to the Black Power movement. They see people being beat. And out here in LA, they really couldn't understand that. This is what they told me. They didn't understand why people would allow themselves to be abused and beaten. So they developed a kind of a different attitude. And what they ended up doing is following people like Malcolm X, who was a black nationalist, who some people consider the godfather, grandfather of the black power movement. Um, his nationalist views, following Elijah Muhammad, and they're, they're actually the Garveyites from the early 1920s will all of those ideologies kind of passed down and young men and women Af and um, African-American men and women, Los Angeles developed organizations like us, Black Panther Party, Che Lumumba Club and other institutions. And some of them told me that is the reason why Watts Rebellion happened is because unlike the South, it's not so much citizens um, perpetrating violence on African-Americans, it's law enforcement. And that's been going on for years. And these young people, um, they rebelled against being taken advantage of, being beaten, being, going through all these different struggles here in Los Angeles, because this is supposed to be the land of opportunity for everyone. And everyone's supposed to have an equal shot, but for African-Americans, it wasn't happening like that. And that's one of the reasons that was developed. This is Ron Karenga and Hakeem Jamal, the founders of the US organization, which was founded in 1965, not long after um, Malcolm X was assassinated and not much longer after the Watts Rebellion. Here's a member of the Black Panther Party being arrested in 1969 after their um, headquarters were attacked by LAPD SWAT unit. So I, I bring this up because most people associate black power with Stokely Carmichael. Um, in 1966, he said he was tired of being beaten and arrested for 27 times. He wasn't going to be arrested anymore. But the backstory to him being arrested was James Meredith. Is anyone familiar with James Meredith? James Meredith was um, the first graduate of Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, in, I think 1962. I'm not sure the number. And he had to fight for the right to go to that institution. And white people wouldn't accept it, but he eventually graduated. And in 1966, he started a march against fear because black people in Mississippi, you know, couldn't register to vote. You tried to register to vote, you would face violence, you would face um, having to pass all kind of tests in order to exercise your right as a citizen of the United States. So he started this march of 220 miles from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi, right? So I think he starts on June 5th. What happens on June 6th? Anyone know? Somebody say he got arrested. He got shot. Yeah. He got shot on day two on his walk. So what happened is organizations like the SCLC headed by Dr. King, SNCC headed by Stokely Carmichael, and uh, I think CORE, headed by James Foreman, took up the march for him. He, luckily, he didn't die, so he was hospitalized. They continued the march. And in towns throughout the march, they would stop and have rallies and speak. So when they, in Mississippi, um, in Greenwood, Mississippi, Stokely Carmichael's arrested for some minor thing, like setting up on public property to have a speech. But when he gets out, he says, you know, I'm tired of being arrested, we're tired of being beaten, and what we need is black power. So before that, let me get this right, his name was Willie Ricks. He was like his advanced man. He would go to the towns before that and tell everybody kind of like this black power thing, black power thing. And on, in Greenwood, what happens, he told Stokely to really talk about the black power thing. So he was like, you know, a hype man. So when Stokely Carmichael said that he's in the audience hyping black power, every time he said, what do we want? Black power. Pretty soon the whole crowd joins in. And that's actually the kind of day that it gets named what it is. But I mention that because it's actually going on, you know, in LA before, not Stokely Carmichael and Muhammad Ali. It's going on 
Black people in L.A. are already exercising black power long before Stokely Carmichael says that Malcolm X um, comes to L.A. and starts Mosque 27 in like 1957. So the ideal of black power already here. And that will be, all of these in, um, time periods I just discussed will be further discussed in the panel. But that's the end conclusion of my presentation. So like right now, I would like to interview Mr. Tyree Boyd Pates. Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing? It's such a pleasure to be here before you. Um, my name is Tyree Boyd Pates. I am the History Curator Program Manager at the California African American Museum. How many of you all have been there before? All right, all right. How many of you have not been there before? You guys are my favorite people because you guys have a visit on your hands. Um, well, we are here for a very specific reason uh, for Black Angelino Trailblazers. Uh, this panel will be discussing the family's work, a Black family's work, and how they've preserved the cultural legacies of their ancestors, um, and how Black history is ultimately shared through the story of Black Angelinos. Um, I would like to give a portion of this time an introduction to recognize some of the Black Angelino families in the room. Um, if you can, and related to, uh, please stand the Ballard family if you're in the room today. Okay. Let's give them a round of applause. Um, and remain standing too, please, please. Uh, can we also have the Mason Owens family stand if any representatives are here today? If not, hey there. Uh, the Watkins family, if you are in the room representing, please stand up. And last but not least, can we have the Edmonds families please stand up? All right. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, wonderful. Um, so uh, I will be serving as the moderator today, and I'm also curating an exhibition alongside the Edmonds family uh, entitled uh, The Liberator Chronicling Black Los Angeles 1900 to 1914 that opens up in about two weeks. I hope to see you all at the opening. Um, but I want to get to introducing the panelists to today, each of which will come out to give you all a five-minute presentation about what they do relating to their families. Um, those individuals are Ariane Edmonds, founder of the J.L. Edmonds Project. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Look at that suit, everyone. <laughs> uh, and then we also have... Uh, um, Jackie Broxton, uh, can we give her a round of applause? She is representing as the executive director of the Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation. And then uh, um, someone who I'm fond of, uh, Tina Watkins of the Watts Labor Community Action Committee. <laughs> we came out to be real bright today for y'all. Um, each of them, again, as I said, will give a presentation, and afterward, I will be in discussion with them. So we're going to have a family talk, and afterward, we'll allow Q&A for all of you who want to join the family as well. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having us. Um, it's an honor to be here, and I want to thank L.A. Maid for putting this panel together and Ariana for inviting us. Um, I'm going to introduce some of my family's history, specifically my grandfather, um, my paternal grandfather. I've got a huge family. My mom and uh, stepmom both have about 15 brothers and sisters and then grandchildren. So we're going to go ahead and, and focus on this one part of my lineage. And what I wanted to provide is some context. So. Ted Watkins uh, was born on Sunday, September 3rd, 1922. And for the course of his life, uh, there were three presidents who served, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and George Bush. Um, the governors of California at the time were Pat Brown, Ronald Reagan, and Jerry Brown. 
And he was actually born, Ted Watkins was born in Mississippi in 1922, and he came to Los Angeles around 1935 when he was 13 years old, fleeing a lynch mob. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment, but the rest of his life he lived out in Watts, the neighborhood of Los Angeles that's just southwest of where we are now. And the interesting thing about the Watts neighborhood is that it went through dramatic demographic shifts. So you only had about one generation or so where you had an initially all white population and mostly farmland in the 20s to the 40s. And then dramatically by 1950, it was majority black and began to be heavily industrialized. And it stayed that way until around 1980, when just by 1990 or so, it became majority Latino. And so living in that kind of environment, having those kind of politics, having that kind of shift, um, changes a lot about the way that you're leading and living. Um, Ted came here, I mentioned he was fleeing a lynch mob. So growing up in Mississippi, one of the issues that he faced um, that we're, I think, saved from a little bit in this day and age, but not much, is the culture of racism. And at that time, if you were walking down the street and you encountered a white person, and my grandfather was a black man, um, they would expect you to step off the sidewalk. He refused to do that. And that night, word got out around his neighborhood that they were going to murder him. So his mom put a tag around his neck and sent him across the United States. And technically, that meant he was part of the great migration that Dr. Keith talked about earlier. But it placed him here in Los Angeles alone at 13 years old. And I want to encourage everyone in this audience, no matter where you are, where you think you stand in life, um, there's more for you. So believe in yourself, document your story. At 13 years old, he didn't know what he was gonna do, and to be honest, he didn't start out doing much here. He was an auto mechanic for a good 20 years or so, and then joined the Ford Auto Workers Union, and from there ended up founding WLCAC. But before uh, too much time had passed, he got married very young, um, was deeply in love with his first wife and had two kids, my uncles, Tamlin and Teddy, and she passed away of tuberculosis. So before he was 20 years old, he was widowed, and he ended up marrying again. And I explained some of the context of this neighborhood, which was majority white for a while. If you look at the woman at the top of this photo, uh, just to the left of the center, that's my grandmother, Bernice, so he married her. So this black man from Mississippi was living with two black sons in Watts, in, you know, they got married in 19, uh, let's see, I think 45 or so in Tijuana because it was illegal to get married in Los Angeles at the time, and they began their family. Um, they were living in Watts at a time where part of the demographic shift from white to black was driven by housing. So you had a lot of single family homes, and then in the 40s, the city of LA started building housing developments. You had uh, the Palm Lane, Gonzac Village, and Imperial Courts housing developments that were built specifically in response to World War II. And then right after that, the Jordan Downs and Nickerson Garden housing developments. And so my grandfather and his wife and my dad, who stood up earlier, and their other children all lived in the Palm Lane housing development. So you have a lot of low-income housing and an economically depressed community that's gone through a radical demographic shift. Um, Context-wise, the nation was, much like we are today, in an uproar. We still haven't healed from the fact that our Constitution says that slavery was not only legal but taxable, that human beings whose skin was darker than certain others were three-fifths human, that women didn't have the right to vote. So all of that is deeply embedded in our country, and even though blacks were migrating to the Midwest and the Far West because these folks hadn't technically supported slavery, the culture of racism was still very alive and well. And so covenant restrictions and racial segregation was still a huge um, part of how the Watts neighborhood was unfolding. So in the national context, um, we had Dr. Martin Luther King, who was just beginning to sort of spread his word and become well known. And then in 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated. And then a few years after that, Dr. King was assassinated. And in the same year, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. So Ted was working in Watts in a time where the country was in an uproar and everyone was sort of fighting for their civil rights. 
and he joined the Ford Motor Company and ended up becoming an international representative for the United Auto Workers Union. But at the core of this, he said, this neighborhood does not have to be the way that it is. We then and now basically suffer indignities that no person should ever have to deal with, toxic air, land, water, um, poor living conditions where the streets aren't maintained, there aren't trash cans, the school systems aren't um, well-funded. And in general, what we know about our country is that when communities are able to pay legally to fight for their legal rights, they have basic human rights. And Watts has never had that kind of resource. Um, Ted, as I mentioned, um, had moved from Mississippi, remarried, begun working at the Ford Motor Company, and then after working his way up through the Ford Motor Company, founded the Watts Labor Community Action Committee. And it was sort of the heyday of the community. The Watts Rebellion had just happened. You had a violent conflict between civilian and law enforcement. Um, while it wasn't videotaped, there were a lot of people around, and for days and days, people fought back. Um, there are a lot of folks who claim it was a riot, um, but those who I know uh, who have a deeper understanding of what happened is that globally, when communities are under attack, you go to war, you fight back, you rebel, and so this wasn't um, sort of a, a temper tantrum of the neighborhood. It was uh, a group of people standing up and saying that they will fight with whatever they have for their civil rights. And so immediately following that rebellion, WLCAC dug in further. Um, what we saw after the rebellion is that a lot of people moved out of the neighborhood, a lot of businesses moved out of the neighborhood, and Ted immediately began doing community organizing, getting people to rebuild the neighborhood, looking at how to introduce housing and any kind of program that was missing in that neighborhood. Um, the government started throwing money at the problem, and WLCAC was sort of right there to help channel and funnel those funds. We started doing community organizing, cleanup, housing construction, and then social services, which I like to describe as all of the things that anyone with a healthy, well-resourced family would need. You may need a place to crash on a couch. You might need uh, a listening ear. You may need a job recommendation. Someone may need to take care of grandma. Those are our aging programs, our uh, employment training programs, our homeless and housing assistance programs, and we serve about 30,000 people a year. But all of these are social services we've maintained since the 60s when Ted started providing them, which was sort of unheard of in this neighborhood. So by the early 1970s, there were two huge infrastructure problem, problems in the neighborhood that Ted helped spearhead community support for that kind of changed the landscape of Los Angeles and Watts. One was the Century Freeway, which because of imminent domain, the city was sort of claiming people's homes and was going to raise them. And this was a problem, of course, in a neighborhood where folks were low income, they had browner skin, and they were literally being kicked out of their houses to make way for this concrete monstrosity. The other was to help build the Martin Luther King Hospital. For the Century Freeway, what was unique is that between Ted's advocacy and a number of other community leaders, they were able to secure a consent decree and make sure that the federal government not only replaced the housing for the people who were displaced for construction, but also that they invested very heavily in the surrounding communities for social services and programs. And Ted took this a step further to negotiate a deal to purchase the homes, instead of destroying them, purchase the homes that were in the path of the freeway, move them on to lots that had been burned to the ground during the Watts Rebellion, and sell them off at a lottery for low-income folks. So you had people who were on welfare living in houses that eventually became theirs. So you ended up having, as we struggle, and I know a lot of folks in the nation struggle with redevelopment questions and how do we do this responsibly, it was an example, if we know the history and look back at those stories, of how you can not only help improve the community, but make sure that you have an expanded impact um, when you're creative about the approach. For the Martin Luther King Hospital, 
This was actually built on the site of the Palm Lane housing developments where he was living, which was a big deal. So he was able to help organize the community in support of this facility because the nearest hospital was miles and miles away and folks in that neighborhood didn't own cars and transportation was one of the other major missing infrastructure pieces. So if you think about the 105 freeway, which now connects the far east end of Los Angeles to the freeway, that was an enormous undertaking for the neighborhood. Um, fast forward to 1992 when once again this area of Los Angeles was under-resourced. Um, our political representation is very fragmented. We actually have like three congressional representatives and two senators and our city councilman both represents the coast of San Pedro and Watts. So our political representation is very fragmented and our relationship with law enforcement has always been very tense. In 1992, there was another rebellion and the work that Ted had done to build out WLCAC, which resulted in us having a seven acre site. We're still there now and I'll encourage you all to come by and visit. It was burned to the ground. And the interesting thing, my father's in the audience today, he describes it as standing on that lot and looking at an angry mob of about two, 300 people surging against the gates to our property and demanding to enter. And what Ted said in the face of his life's work being destroyed was, if we've come to the place where we need to be combative with the neighborhood to fight for what we've built, then we've lost our usefulness. So they all went home, and they watched this place go up in flames, and he got back to work the next day and rebuilt within a year. And the thing that makes me so proud to work at WLCAC today is the response our leaders had. It would have been very easy to uh, sort of become more insular and isolated and protected and shut off from the community. And instead, they took physical design steps to make sure our, our site had even more access to people. And they started installing community gathering spaces and recommitted to cultural programming and education so that people could come into our site, learn about the history of not only our nation, but law enforcement and our unique community dynamics. And so we literally welcomed folks in with open arms immediately after. So all of that happened within a year and then we built that out until about 2000 when Tim was elected president of WLCAC. And WLCAC had already, um, following the Watts Rebellion, begun buying up land, building housing, hundreds of units of housing. Some of them were sold, some of them remain low-income housing units because, as we know, affordable housing is a crisis in Los Angeles and remains. And what Tim did to balance that out was begin a commercial land banking project. So all along Central Avenue, Tim began buying land and making sure that WLCAC owned not only the housing in the neighborhood, but also um, all of the industrial opportunities that we could afford. Um, he also began just dreaming. And so WLCAC in 2005 envisioned a place called Mudtown Farms, which is actually sort of a return to Watts agricultural roots, where in a two and a half acre plot of land, we're building an urban park and farm and teaching people in the neighborhood how to activate their own backyards. And so this farm park is opening in 2019. It's sort of unheard of. And it's one of the first examples of us returning not only to Watts roots, but WLCAC's roots, where we used to farm under the power lines until folks began uh, actually stealing the food from those um, plots, and so we ended the program. The last thing that WLCAC has embarked upon recently, and again, we're maintaining and building on Ted's vision, um, is something called the Better Watts Initiative. So we're aware of the, the many issues that plague Watts, but the wonderful thing about it is how resilient its people are and how um, proud and territorial we are to be from what something about living through two fires <laughs> means that no one and nothing can stand against you and adding to those troubles um, Tim has uncovered scientific evidence that unfortunately the area um, from the southwest corner all the way up to the northeast corner is highly toxic. The soil, the water, the, the air is all laden with lead, heavy metals, and chemicals that are uh, populated by a combination of 
basically poor management and poison. And so you have a combination of corporations, ExxonMobil in some cases, LAX, airport, and fuel dumping that happens on the way to the airport, and then some of the side effects of freeway construction and some of the impacts of poor or lack of urban greening mean that everyone who lives in that neighborhood is exposed to higher levels of toxicity. And while we're doing the work that we are, which is to basically stand, to put a foothold in and say the people here matter, the stories here matter, and it's not enough to you know, redevelop a community and not take care of the people who live there, one of the challenges is making sure that the people who live there who may or may not have gotten sick are compensated, are cared for, um, are healthy as the future of that community thrives. So that is WLCAC um, and some of Ted's history. And I thank you for listening. Well, you didn't finish showing us all the photographs. The clicker likes you better than me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go right ahead. But I do remember when your grandfather had the houses on uh, platforms on Central mm -hmm. Avenue before they moved. Am I dating myself? Uh, anyway, um, my name is Jackie Broxton. I'm the executive director of the Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation. And we are a group of community volunteers. I, the light is in my eyes, so I can't tell who's here. Pam, could you stand? I see you, Cynthia. I see you, Ortho. I think I see three board members. And Jessica, is there anyone else here? I can't tell. And Pat, okay. Um, and our whole mission is to provide meaningful resources and support for foster youth. In Los Angeles County, there are 30,000 kids in the foster care system. 30,000 kids. And of that total, about 3,000 emancipate every year. We believe that if Biddy Mason were alive today, she would want to do something about that. It's impossible to be a member of First AME Church and not know about Biddy Mason. She was the founder. Um, so what we found, however, is when we go out into the community, a lot of people don't know who she is. They have no idea of her contributions or her struggle. So we have made that our kind of secondary mission to make her name a household word. So at each of our events, which at the present time, we do events for foster youth. We do a resource fair in April where we invite agencies that provide support to foster youth in. Uh, we have right now, the event is next month, and we have about 30 agencies, colleges, universities, and employers that are going to participate. But we always have one table set aside that details Biddy Mason's history. And it's interesting because foster youth become fascinated with it. Uh, we've got a couple of our scholarship winners from last year who are actually doing some, some research on her. Uh, and it also provides us with an opportunity to showcase other famous African Americans. Because unfortunately, when you're in the foster care system and if you are a child of color, you don't always know about your own history. So here you are in a system where you've been taken away from your parents Many times you're alienated from the rest of the family for whatever reason was going on with your parents. And then you're part of a minority that you don't know much about and that you hear a lot of negative things about. It doesn't add up to a person feeling real good about themselves. So we try to incorporate the history in each of the things that we do. Uh, currently we're running a promote, we have a, an agreement with Starbucks in 13 of their stores. And these cards are on a display. There's some out in the lobby. We've, we were now going through our third printing. And each printing is 1,500 cards. So we feel like we're getting her name out there. Um, we also celebrate her birthday every year on August 15th. This is the flyer from last year. And the luncheon for her birthday was actually held at the Japanese American Cultural Center on San Pedro Street. So you're probably wondering, well, why would you have it there? Well, actually, Biddy Mason used to own that land. 
So we're in the process of trying to identify the other properties that we owned, and hopefully each year we can do something at one of those sites if it's permissible. I heard a rumor from someone that she may have owned the land where Macy's was downtown. So I don't know what we can work out there. Uh, but the committee works all year to do the resource fair in April. We also do Thanksgiving dinner on Thanksgiving Day, which utilizes community volunteers. If you're a foster kid and you're growing up in a group home, you don't really get a sense of what a traditional Thanksgiving dinner is like. So each year, we this is about the sixth year that we've done this, and it's always um, in the beginning, we were doing potluck because we didn't have any money. And as we were cleaning up, sitting around the table, one of the kids was drawing and he was sitting next to me and I said, he sat there for a long time and I said, did you get any clothes? Because we always give away free clothing and hygiene items. And he said, yeah, I did, it's in the other room. I said, well, okay. So then I waited and then about 20, 30 minutes later, he was still sitting there drawing. And I said, you're still here. Don't you want to go get your stuff? And he said, ma'am, I'm just enjoying sitting here listening to you guys talk. So then I realized if he had been in a, quote, normal family situation, that's what had been going on. So since that time, we now have the event catered. And we spend the time with the kids, which is what they want. And it's really about what they want, not what we want. Um, we also give away scholarships. Last year, we gave away $30,000 worth of scholarships. We had 84 applicants. The average GPA was 3.0. These are bright, intelligent kids who just need someone to care about them. Um, sometimes when you've been in the system a long time, you don't want to be pressured about being involved in something. So we kind of let the kids come to us. And the ones who we've been able to maintain a relationship with it's worked out well because we've helped them with supplemental funding for other things. Um, this is just, this photograph is only a small percentage because a lot of the kids had already left to go away to school. But they call, they send us uh, copies of their transcripts, their grades. That all tells us all they want is someone to care. It's not, a, it's not rocket science. If you go back to when you were a teenager, if you did well, you wanted your parents to know that you did well. And it's the same thing with them. Uh, the resource fair, if you look in the upper corner, you see a woman in purple bending over. For those of you who think you can't do anything, um, this woman crochets all year. She brings her items to the fair and she gives them away to the kids, talks to them, explains to them how to, how to utilize them. So we believe there is a shoe to fit every foot. You may not be able to write a check. You may not be able to come and work events. But there's something that you could do, and we encourage you to find out what that is. That's the only way this is ever going to change, is if everybody works together. Um, these events, this is Thanksgiving. Um, the, the little boy that you see with the bright smile, he is growing up with an aunt in Hesperia. Every time we have an event, she drives from Hesperia and brings he and his two brothers, because there's nothing like this going on in that area. So I guess what I'm trying to say to all of you is foster care is an enormous problem. You can't depend on the Department of Children and Family Services to solve it. We've all got to get into this together to make an impact and to make a difference. And this is what we think Biddy would have done if she was still alive. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, my story, my story starts with Jefferson Lewis Edmonds. Um, uh, he was my great-great-grandfather, uh, and he was born in Lonsdale County, Mississippi, um, on the Edmonds Plantation, uh, and he transformed his life completely. Uh, and in his 60-odd years, he became a farmer, um, a newspaper editor, a father, uh, and a grandfather, um, and really kind of transformed Los Angeles. Um, 
This is an article that he wrote in 1909 for the Los Angeles Times explaining the first day he found out he was free. So Jefferson was not only um, born into slavery, but he spent maybe about 10 years after, into his 20s, um, as a sharecropper on the plantation. Um, after that, he went on to learn to read and write through the freedom schools uh, during the Reconstruction era and became a teacher and a civil rights activist and traveled around Mississippi after the passing of the 15th Amendment, which allowed black men the ability to vote. He would go around canvassing, encouraging folks to be able to um, uh, to bring in their own represent their own uh, representatives. So this is just a, a beautiful picture of some of the early um, senators of some of the southern states, and Jefferson played a big role in helping to get some of these men elected. Um, but he found that his efforts were met with a lot of um, resistance. He kind of documents uh, in a testimony. He, you know, what is so interesting is that. With Jefferson, everything was documented. And you talked about that, Tina. There's something about making sure that your story is told and that it's documented. Um, Jefferson was invited to participate in a Senate hearing uh, in 1875 that was investigating uh, voter suppression. And that is not new. So this has been going on. Um, <laughs> He participated in this to talk about what he experienced on his way to the polls. He talked about men being murdered on their way to go and vote um, and being attacked and harassed. Uh, and, you know, there's a quote from him saying that the best thing about the South was that we left it. And so um, he, he worked the trains, which I heard from my, my great aunt, Evelyn, um, who I'm sure is, you know, is here with us. She's passed on. But um, she mentioned that, they, that he worked on the trains uh, and saved enough money to bring his family to Los Angeles. Uh, and while he was here, he did all kind of stuff. Um, he started uh, a newspaper called The Liberator, um, and this paper ran from 1900 to 1914, um, and he collaborated with Booker T. Washington, who wrote articles for the paper, uh, documented speeches from W. Du Bois, um, and if you can see right here on the right-hand side, he uh, highlighted businesses folks who were um, kind of helping to build the foundation of Black Los Angeles. And during this time, um, there was just actually a couple thousand Black people living in LA. So this is at the turn of the century. Um, and him, with his contemporaries, helped to kind of lay the foundation for the generations or the um, new generations to come to LA. Um, he used his paper to advocate for farming and for home ownership and for land ownership. These are some pictures that I found at my Aunt Carol and Laurel's house. They let me kind of go in and dig every couple years. Uh, <laughs> they trust me, which I'm so grateful for. Um, <laughs> uh, he also was a huge advocate for women's rights and fought for women, uh, for our ability to vote. Uh, this is on Susie, who was also one of the editors of the newspaper. So he, you know, employed a lot of women journalists. Um, he was very fair. You know, he would talk about, um, you know, when people criticized some of the policies that he backed, he would print it in his paper. He was like, let me let you know what the haters are saying, because you should know the whole story. Um, he also started uh, a real estate business with Noah D. Thompson, who soon became uh, the assistant editor of the paper um, and took over the paper when Jefferson got very sick. Um, and Noah D. Thompson is responsible for bringing uh, the Marcus Garvey movement to Los Angeles. He worked at the Tuskegee Institute under Booker T. Washington um, and helped to kind of build the foundation of, of uh, a lot of the kind of community building that was happening in LA. Um, so around this time, Jefferson uh, passed, so in 1914, right before the development of the NAACP um, and all these other amazing kind of rights, uh, civil rights movements. Um, so he was kind of right at that cusp. Uh, so that's, I think that's a big reason why I do this work, is to make sure that his, um, his significance and, the, and his, um, his love for this city uh, is documented. Um, 
think this is the last one. I think that's it. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you all for each of your presentations, and now we can all uh, have the family conversation. <laughs> uh, um, considering all of your involvement, I, I'm going to ask a few questions, and then we're going to open up to the audience to see if they have any. Um, but I want to start with you, Ariana. Not only you're a good friend, but you're a, a, cur a co-curator for uh, an exhibition around your great-grandfather's work. And I just want to ask you and have the audience here, um, what stories were told to you growing up about your family's newspaper, The Liberator? You know, it's interesting because I believe that there is kind of one person from each family that's kind of dedicated to this work. And I think sometimes they're, they're called by either the ancestors or, you know, just the person who's the most curious and has, asks a lot of questions. Um, so before me, it was my grandfather and my Aunt Laurel also did a ton of research, uh, including my cousin Dawson. So people play uh, very specific roles in being able to put this whole story together. Um, but after my grandfather passed, we didn't talk about Jefferson that much. Um, and I remember learning that we had a newspaper and that was kind of it. I knew we had did an exhibition a couple, year, a couple years before I was born. Um, and I, this, uh, I just remember my grandfather telling me about um, his, stu his, his kids going to integrated schools in 1900, and I don't remember that ever being the case anywhere else in the country. Um, so I started doing some research and started doing some digging and talking to a few family members and interviewing them, and they're like, oh yeah, we have this paper, it's no big deal. And um, I lost it because <laughs> I started, and you know, I talked to my dad about it, and he was like, yep, it's in my home office. It's over here. And he like opened up this case, and it was just all that we, he kept all the papers. So, um, you know, it was, uh, so it's a mixture of stories. There's letters. I think everyone in my family has touched this in some way. Um, but I think it's, uh, I feel responsible for making sure that we share it with the rest of this, the rest of our, um, our Angelinos. Thank you, Ari. Um, Tina, this allows me to piggyback on Ari's response because sharing stories of the black Angelino experience definitely is attached to the city of Watts. Um, and being black and in Watts is something that uh, um, we all have heard stories of of in periodicals, but you know it much more intimately because of your father's work. And so my question is, um, you've shared a little bit about your father, Ted Watkins' vision for the city of Watts, but how are you uh, caring or stewarding that vision today? And, and tell them about the experience I had when, uh, when you gave me that tour of the wonderful facility. Sure. Um, we've actually kind of encapsulated Ted's vision and carry it forward as our vision today, which is that Watts would be a place where anyone would be happy to live or work or play. Um, and the tour that Terry refers to, and I welcome all of you to come to WLCAC. We're 10 blocks off the, the Century Freeway he helped build. And we have a very inexpensive or free, don't get mad at me, boss is in the corner. Um, <laughs> tour that we developed in response to the 92 Rebellion that walks visitors through a three-part experiential journey that kind of unpacks um, our nation's history and our local history dealing with racism and segregation and law enforcement and civic engagement. And so it starts with a recreation of a slavehold and it's, it's a very intense tour and they have sort of brilliantly and organically allowed it to tap dance all over folks' emotions, but also jam pack it full of facts and information so that um, people who participate can really be galvanized to act and respond and not ever forget about it. And so the second part of the tour after the slaveholder recreation is a reconstruction of a Mississippi Delta Road, partly in homage to Ted's um, upbringing and then partly to kind of touch on the reconstruction era that followed the quote unquote abolishment of slavery. And we know that the 13th Amendment says that it's still legal in prisons. And so that part of our, our industry is still very alive and well. And so it walks us through what that meant culturally for a nation that pretty much just passed a law but never dealt with any of the culture, any of the um, impacts of slavery and racism. We do more now to kind of affect 
the um, impacts of sexual harassment than we do for racism or segregation in our nation. And the last part of the tour is looking at um, a photographic exhibit uh, that chronicles the last year of Dr. King's life. And it's sort of uh, balanced out by a series of exhibitions that Tim has curated that look at um, ephemera and all the objects and all of the ways that our nation has kind of um, driven home the idea that black people are inferior. And so there's household items that um, have children in compromising positions and men in compromising positions and it's glasses and games and toys for babies that basically sell this idea that black people are less than. And so we have those three phases and I or Timothy or a couple other trained volunteers walk you through it. Um, and each tour is carefully kind of customized and tailored. And so we, we shepherd that, but we also, and this is how Ariana and I connected, have painstakingly preserved everything we can about Ted Watkins' life and then everything we can about WLCAC's work. Um, we ended up partnering with Cal State Dominguez Hills, actually, and have a digital online library now. So some of the work and history of WLCAC is available to the public online now, which is exciting. Um, but really, it's documenting the stories and not only continuing the work, but expanding on it. So. Thank you. Um, which leads me to, to have a conversation with you, Ms. Broxton, about um, Biddy Mason. You may not be related to her, but tell us about what drew you to Betty Mason's story and, and doing this type of work in the community through First AME Church. Well, first of all, I'm a history buff. Right. So I became very curious about her years ago when I um, joined First AME. Little did I know, I think Cheryl Cox is here. Cheryl, where are you? Okay, up in the corner. And, and microphone. Uh, she's up in the corner. I, um, Cheryl and my daughter went to high school together, and I used to give her a ride home every day, but I didn't know the relationship, that this was a descendant of Biddy Mason. Um, so when we decided that we wanted to do something for foster youth, because I had been working for an agency for many years that deals with foster youth, so I saw on the flip side what happens with these kids. And it seemed only natural that if she were alive, this would definitely be something that she would be interested in because she took people into her home. Um, and then I met this crazy group of people um, who are now the board of directors who are as obsessed with this whole change thing as I am. So it made it very easy to continue the work. Um, one of our board members always says that when we finally get in our building, he's going to buy us all a straight jacket because we're all crazy. <laughs> crazy for history. I think you. I think you have to be a little crazy to to just not give up. Right. You know. Right, right, right. right. Uh, and to pursue it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we all are invested in this work of of preserving Black history. Uh, I know it intimately working at the California African American Museum, but I'm often inspired by each of your resolves to persist and persevere and include people um, in the larger conversation of black history, because we all know black history is American history. Mm -hmm. Am I right? <laughs> right. Let me hear you if you agree with that. <laughs> Just double checking. Just want to give a thermometer check. Um, and it's important. Um, I, I know we're, we're down to time, and I also want to allow the, uh, the rest of the room to ask, ask a question or two. But if you can, can you give um, a, a takeaway or, 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 or something to give to the audience about how they, too, can uh, be uh, chronicle black history of, and the black Angelino experience in Los Angeles, if they're, whether that experience is here or elsewhere? And I'll, I want to start with you, and we'll end with Aria. Sure. Um, guard it at all costs. Um, one of the, the biggest challenges Tim, my father, and I faced in protecting Ted, my, our grandfather's legacy, was being careful not to lose ownership of it or control of his story. And what you undervalue, someone else may understand perfectly the value of. And so there are folks who actively look for people who have garages full of information that they're just trying to get rid of or old family photos they don't want to hang on to. 
the stories of our lives are so vital. It's what we teach our kids. It's what helps us establish our identity. It's what helps us to shape policy and document the human experience and connect with one another. And when those stories are lost or if they're imbalanced, the result is that people feel less than. I grew up learning about white history and it wasn't until maybe a third of the way through my education, I began to learn about other forms of history. And so it, it helps us to connect with each other and to have a more full life and a better connection with all of our neighbors when we understand each other's shared history. So keep those photographs, print them out. An archivist actually told me that one of their biggest challenges is not um, collecting photographs, it's that people only have them digitally now mm -hmm. and they're not uh, maintaining them. So hold on to them and do not give them away <laughs> until you know for sure that whoever, and, and by giving them away I mean educational institutions, uh, museums, libraries, be very mindful and careful as I know Ariana has, as we have, in making sure that your family owns that material still and that the, the story that is told about them is yours to tell. So. I would say um, I have two grandsons. And what I have started doing is I have notebooks. When certain things happen, like when Katrina hit, I collect, I'm still paper. I, I, I know we can digitize this, but I'm still a paper person. Um, I saved a lot of newspaper articles. I wrote notes on them about how I felt the people were being treated in New Orleans because they don't understand that. I mean, the oldest one now is 16. He's beginning to come into it, but the younger one is 10. When I'm gone, this is a record for them. Uh, and as, as you stated, also save your family history, your photographs, but record your own history because that's what you, you don't know what effect it's gonna have on the generations that follow you. So keep journals, the things that are really, you know, dicey, put them someplace else. <laughs> but keep journals. <laughs> because you're duly noted <laughs> because, because you're you're your descendants are going to know, want to know about that yeah you know I think it's a few things you know if you have things that are prize you know uh, prize like possessions within your your family history it's important to find the right kind of collaborators and partners to help you share that story you know us being able to partner with the Los Angeles library was something that took 10 years um, you know, we've been kind of figuring out where the best home uh, for this story could be. Uh, and the library was one of the only places that was willing to share this with the public and make this information readily available. Um, and so if you have any stories that you think is important, finding the right collaborators and partners uh, and institutions to support you is key. Um, and, you know, it's to, the other thing that I would add uh, that you shared, Miss Jackie, is that um, you know, I think we think about our wills and our legacies and we think about some of the physical things like handing down maybe a home or, um, you know, whatever you have left in your will. But there are stories that need to be documented and also included um, the work that we're doing. The, the way that I view my work is not just I'm telling the story to all of you. I'm connecting with my ancestors and connecting with the stories and the letters that were saved for us and for me. Um, to be able to share with all of you. And then we're preparing this work for a generation that I will never meet, um, that I will never uh, interact with, and they may never know my name. Um, but they um, were thought about today, um, and we're honoring them today. And I think that when we approach our stories uh, for an audience that, um, or for a new generation that needs to remember how we felt um, so, yeah. Well. Okay. Drama. Um, now this will be our very um, brief uh, Q&A portion. Uh, and so we, I, I imagine we have several runners who are going to uh, offer the microphone. Um, and so I ask that for those who have the opportunity um, to to also wait for the microphone as we are recording this. But also, um, very, very importantly, this is the Q&A portion, not the um, keynote speech portion <laughs> or, or the statement portion. 
or um, any other rendition uh, <laughs> or open mic. So please, uh, for, for, um, for consideration of the ancestors and the purposes of us being here, please provide us a question and only thereof. Thank you very much. Hi, thank, my name is Dion. Thank you all Hi, for man. hosting. This is absolutely wonderful. I'm a black Angelino recently coming back home after 20 years being away. So this is very, very, um, sorry. Now I'm, now I'm elaborating. Anyway, my question is, um, has there, are you guys aware of a movement of getting some of, um, you know, your family's histories or maybe black, other black Angelino family histories integrated actually into the public education school system so that it's not only lost, um, you know, with you all, but actually documented. So I'm here with my younger cousins, you know, that they can learn about the beautiful history that we've um, had an impact. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's something that has been pretty, like a, a long fight. Charlotta Bass, uh, who was the um, editor of The Eagle, one of the last editors of The Eagle, um, uh, partnered um, with the city to make sure that all the information about the original 11 settlers were included um, in like general education. However, I didn't learn about it and I don't know about the Angelinos in the room. I don't think that's information that was shared. Um, but in partnership with California African American Museum and the Facing uh, History and Ourselves, I believe Mary is here today. She's right here in the back. <laughs> um, we have partnered um, with um, there. It's a national, actually, a global organization that creates um, educational material based around firsthand accounts. Uh, so it's like you know letters and interviews from folks that experience different times, different kind of turbulent times in history. Um, and so we're going to be creating curriculum around the Liberator and all the things that were documented. Uh, in that paper to be included in the curriculum uh, and to be shared in Los Angeles School District, yes. The digitizing of the Liberator, will we be able to, is it all of the issues for the whole run? Will we be able to read them and look at them? Hi. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to see you. <laughs> I wanted to, okay, thank you. <laughs> so I, I think the question is, will all the Liberators that will be digitized be available for public consumption? Yes. Okay. That's a great question, yes. So there's a few years where Jefferson took a break. I don't know why, but I'm gonna find out. Um, but uh, our family has kept the full run of the paper and it's been handed down for over a century. Um, and so we are now in the process of getting it digitized and it should be available um, by the end of this year. Yeah. Um, I would love to take maybe one or two more questions and then we will uh, sign off. Um, runners. <laughs> Running. <laughs> Please state your name and their question. Hi, my name's Leanne, and this was a fantastic presentation. Um, I guess my question is a bit rhetorical, but I'm concerned. I'm so, um, I really value the whole family archive thing. And nowadays, I mean, all of us, no matter what community you're from, our families are so fractured, mm -hmm. at, as in where is the family? Mm -hmm. And it's so difficult to maintain that thread. And what was so great was that all of you have such a deep connection. How are we going to, I guess, reform our families so that we can get the value from all this? I don't know. It's a great question. Okay. It's a great, how will we reform our families so that we can better archive that history, perhaps? Um, <laughs> yes, and also, in a sense, have, have more of a family. Okay. Because we don't, we, the collective, all of us across LA, huh. and it's super important. Look at the value sure. it produces. L let's take it one by one, if, if you all have an answer that you'd like to offer. I'm always an advocate for starting within. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've found with my family is if I'm not right, then none of my relationships with the rest of the family are right. <laughs> um, and my husband and son are actually here. And so that's, I have to consider that my first family, so to speak. <laughs> He's awesome. He has a little afro back there in the striped sweater. But um, 
I start first with documenting my immediate family and then making sure that your relationships are clean and then finding traditions that you can create. My grandfather handed down a tradition that my dad maintains where we all go camping every year. And thankfully my husband loved camping, so we continue that. But when you have a gathering point, that helps. This is a gathering point for Angelino families. When you're healthy, it helps too, because to be honest, families are fractured because they're unhealthy and it's healthier sometimes to not connect. And and so those are my <laughs> facts. facts. <laughs> I'll pass the collection plate on that one. Um, but but your your own health and then where you can creating traditions and then documenting those. Well said. Well said. Yeah. Um, I think I agree with everything that you're saying. I think also if you're in a situation where you have a family that's fragmented, hmm. find something safe that you can do together. For instance, you could come and volunteer on Thanksgiving. Okay. <laughs> Yes. You saw how she did that? You saw how she and that could around? be the start of your tradition. That, that was a good sales pitch. <laughs> I'm taking that one with me. Okay. Um, you know, it's so interesting because I think, you know, we, for those of you that were here at the beginning, you know, we talk about the original uh, 11 families that started Los Angeles. Um, and they didn't, you know, uh, King Carlos uh, III, who, you know, commissioned um, you know, these settlers to come to Los Angeles and settle the city. Uh, he didn't send just, you know, 10 or 14 people. He sent families, children, mm -hmm. parents um, to create and the foundation of the city, many of whom were of African descent and indigenous Mexican people. So this city is built around, um, around a sense of family. Uh, and I think that's something that we all get to share no matter how fragmented our, our communities are. There's something powerful about chosen family uh, and creating safe spaces with families, with people who understand your values and maybe your family may not have that. And you also need to document that experience um, because that's important and someone needs that, needs that story to help save them from an experience they may have that you got through. Um, so... Yeah, I think that would be it. Well, um, I want to round out third or fourth. Um, Ariane and I, again, have been working uh, together for several months, um, bringing, um, bringing things together. And, and I also want to address and bring this about that to the sister's question about the availability of the Liberator. This will be the platform as to which it will be available at LAPL, and this is Tessa. So you all see this. Please take a photo. Take the web URL. Uh, I'm sure you guys will want to learn as much about the Liberator as possible. And then moreover, um, Ariane and I is opening for Ariane and I's and Taylor Bythewood Porter's opening of the Liberator chron chronicling Black Los Angeles 1900 to 1914 will open up at the California African American Museum on March 20th. Um, and we will be having, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and that, that is a relationship that came out with LAPL and Ariane and the, and the Edmonds family, so we are so grateful. Um, and it will be an exposure to the Liberator itself, but also through the lens of, um, of her great-grandfather and how it impacts us all today. It's very important. Um, I just want to say thank you thank to each of, let's give them a round of applause. Um, and wanted to thank the LAPL. And I, I just want to also special thanks to all of our partners, um, of which who are on the, the screen. But I want you all to know this, like Ariane's great-great-grandfather wrote a newspaper that had a run of 14 years. I do not think he knew that 100 years later we would be sitting around this conversation, right? And as, a, as my career, I get to see people who really put their foot into history, and I want us to also also to take that we're making history right now. And so own that today. Own your archive, own your story, own your narrative. And hopefully 100 years later from now, we'll be sitting on the stage talking about you. Thank you all very much. And I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon.